about um, a topic Islam the misunderstood religion Islam the misunderstood religion and the first thing I would look, like uh, to talk about the first thing I'd like to talk about is Islam itself what does the word Islam mean okay so the word Islam so you you'll often find that people say the word Islam means peace and it is true in a sense that Islam means peace um, in the sense that peace, true peace, which is inner peace. You know, often we think of peace being as the absence of war. But actually this is a very limited and narrow definition of peace. As just the absence of war. Because in fact, in reality, we may not have war, but we still may not have peace. Okay, many societies may not be at war with other countries, but you'll find that those societies themselves are full of internal conflicts. Um, so, no, peace is a product of Islam, and when we say peace, we mean a deep inner tranquility that is something that for the one who really truly follows Islam, they will experience peace. But actually, the word Islam itself um, means submission. It means submission. Okay, and before the, the, you know, before the film Fitna, yeah, there was another film which was called, I think, by a Danish filmmaker, he called it Submission. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious the question I'm going to ask you. What, what do you think of the word submission in the context of your average Norwegian, yeah? <laughs> do you think, what do you think, that's positive or negative? Huh? Submission. Do you think that's a positive word or a negative word for your average Norwegian? Huh? Yeah, it's negative, right? If you say Islam means submission, <laughs> they'll say, yeah, Islam means submission and we have freedom. So I'm not interested in that, thank you very much, right? Because submission, in, you know, in the context certainly of the Western ideologies, is a very negative concept, okay? But what I really want to talk about, you know, is what does submission mean? What is the reality of submission? And in fact, I would like to point out to you that submission is something that we do uh, all the time in our lives. We are always submitting in our lives throughout our lives. In fact, I would like to lay a challenge down to every freedom-loving person, okay? Uh, because the term freedom, really, similarly, if you look at freedom, it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as absolute freedom. No society leaves you absolutely free to do absolutely whatever you like. Is that true or not? It's true. Okay? So, the, the set, you know, freedom in an absolute sense is something that just does not exist. When a country says we are freedom, we believe in freedom, of course, if you discuss with intelligent people, they, what they mean is they, they will say, no, we are more free in this and this and this area than other nations. But that's not how it's sold to you. It's not how it's sold. Because actually you're being sold an idea. And the idea you're being sold is freedom. And everybody likes the idea of being free. Actually, I would say, the ideal is that you could leave everybody absolutely free to do whatever they like and there's no rules to govern their behavior and people would just automatically behave in the best way. That would be the ideal, right? Okay, we don't have any laws, we don't have any rules, everyone just behaves in the right way, everyone treats each other in the right way, 
Yeah? And this would be the ideal situation, right? No government, no control. Okay, but this, this is unrealistic. There's no historical precedent, really. Maybe some islands, I don't know, somewhere, you know, who have something like that. But human beings, there's not something that we find that human beings have ever been able to accomplish something like that. So all society, all human societies, including this one in which we live, they are trying to strike a balance, right? They're trying to strike a balance between two things. One is individual freedom, one is individual freedom, and the other is limiting that freedom in order to protect society. Because when human beings live together, and we talked about this yesterday, what we need to do as society in order that people, different people, do different jobs and society is able to run and people conform to laws and they obey those laws, what we have to try and do is socialize people. We have to try and get people to buy into an ideal and a concept, a way of living and according to this, people are given different tasks, people do different duties, people follow laws and this is the reality. We need those laws and they limit the restriction, they restrict the freedom of the individual in order to protect the society. And the debate that is always going on in every society, and sometimes it's more obvious than others, how much do we li limit, how much do we limit the freedom of the individual in order to protect the society? Yeah? Now this is very, very clear in America and Britain where we have had terrorist attacks. Okay? So Britain and America, they've had terrorist attacks. And this debate, this whole debate has come to the forefront. Because obviously America, especially, you know, is, well, used to be very much concerned with, you know, freedom, freedom of speech, and many freedoms that people are given. Okay, so American society is concerned with that. But now they have passed a whole series of very, very draconian laws, which is known as the Patriot Act. And these laws, obviously, they restrict the freedoms that people have. So what you have is a type of a statement that's an oxymoron. It's a type of contradiction in terms. In order for us to continue our freedoms, we're going to have to limit your freedom. This is what they say. So in order for us to keep on being free, we have to limit your freedom. And this is the same thing, the debate is in UK. Is that how much can we keep restricting people's freedoms in order to protect our society? Because what happens is we get to a stage where we don't even respect what we consider to be human rights anymore. Because in order to protect ourselves from terrorism or whatever it may be, we have restricted the humans so much that we even now begin to trample upon and restrict their human rights. Okay? But actually, this is the debate that all societies are having all the time. But one thing I want us to realize, whether we are Muslim, Christian, Jew, whether our, our, we have a secular outlook, there is something that all of us, I think, have in common. Right? And it's, a, it's disingenuous for anyone in the press or for politicians, okay, or even to suggest really otherwise. That we all have something in common. The vast majority of us, whoever we are, whatever we are, we, most of us, want to live in a peaceful society and a prosperous society. We are concerned that we want our children to be protected. Okay, we want to be protect, protected. We don't want our goods to be stolen. We don't want our children to be preyed upon. We don't want our women to be raped. Yeah? We don't want people to have psychological problems. Okay? We don't want violence in the streets. We want to be able to live in a society where we can buy, where we can sell, where we can exchange goods, where we can try to live a prosperous, happy life. Now, every, most human beings, that's what they want. Right? That's what they want. Muslims are not any different. And for anyone to suggest that Muslims want anything different, or that Islam itself as a religion teaches anything different, is at the very least disingenuous, at the most it is perhaps plain evil. When we are talking about Islam, the misunderstood religion, 
One of the things that I like to point out to people, and actually a documentary maker in England did this. The press in England has actually, over the years, invented pure lies about Muslims. I mean, I am t saying pure lies. And one documentary maker, he actually commissioned a university study to look at the news reports about Muslims and to actually analyze them and actually trace down and question the people whom they had been claimed. For example, Muslims want Christmas banned. Yeah? This comes up again and again. Muslims want Christmas banned. In such and such council, in such and such province, yeah? Muslims demanded that Christmas trees should not be such and such, right? In fact, when the journalist went and they actually interviewed the council, the council said, this is absolute rubbish, no such thing happened, right? All, all that happened was one Muslim one, was asked to come to a Christmas party and said, I'm sorry, I can't come to the Christmas party or something. And from that was a, a really a total lie. For example, another type of lie is Muslim in hospital, hospital demands that pig is, picture is taken down from the wall, right? Okay, I mean, I hear this is something that someone had. It maybe it happened, but there are stories like this which they were discovered were actually absolute li fabrications, lies, right? The other thing was Sharia law. Muslims want to implement Sharia law, okay? And then what did they do? They went around, they actually did a poll and they interviewed Muslims and they said, Do you want Sharia law in England? Right? And they found like 40% of Muslims said, yes, they want Sharia law in England, and this and that. So they came with these statistics, okay? And there was a big hullabaloo about Muslims want Sharia law in England, okay? And actually, what this journalist did is he took these headlines, and he, all he did, something very simple. He took out the word Muslim, and he put the word Jew. That's all he did. He took out the word Muslim, and he put in the word Jew. And then he went on the street and he showed people. Jews want their own law. Jews want to be able to practice their own laws. <laughs> Same headline, but the word Muslim was taken out. And he said, what do you think of this headline? They said, that's very racist. That's anti-Semitic. That's inflammatory. Right? Okay. Jews want Christmas banned. Oh, that they shouldn't say that uh, about Jews, yeah? I mean, all the headlines, you went, and he showed them a whole series of these headlines. They just placed the, replaced the word Muslim with Jew. And then he went and said, actually, those were not real headlines. Here are the real headlines. And he showed them what the papers had said. And you should have seen the faces of those people, right? Looking ashamed of themselves. Ashamed of themselves, right? I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, and whoever's here is not a Muslim, anything you have against Islam, I can find something worse in the biblical law, which Jews adhere to and they believe in. In fact, there are so many death punishments in the biblical law, I can't remember, I, I haven't counted them. One of them is breaking the Sabbath. The punishment for breaking the Sabbath is death. The punishment for hitting your parents according to the Judaic law, is death. Hitting your parents is death, right? But we don't find anyone going out and, you know, Jews claim that you should kill your parents, yeah? Uh, you know, no, no, Jew, Jews claim you should slaughter your children for touching their parents, yeah? And stuff like that. Because quite rightly, quite rightly, I have to say, this type of these type of words and these type of statements, right, are inflammatory. And we all know, and we should all know, where did 150, 200, 300, actually it's a long more time than that, okay? Actually this type of attitude towards Jews started a long, long time ago in Christendom. But it all ended up after, by the way, a lot of years of massacres of Jews. The Jews were not only massacred by Hitler in the concentration camps. If you look in European history, Jews have been slaughtered throughout European history. Okay? That was just the most nasty and the most dramatic of them. But what came behind the slaughter of the Jews was years and years of propaganda, anti-Semitism. 
And in fact, if you look at the type of stuff that people are saying about Muslims today, it is exactly the same type of things that were being said about Jews in the past. Exactly the same type of things. Okay? And this actually, in my opinion, is a very nasty streak that exists within Europeans. Despite all of their claims of tolerance and all of their claims of being open-minded and this and that, there is a very nasty streak, that, a nasty anti-Semitic streak that runs throughout European history. And this type of propaganda that we find against Islam is just another branch of it. It's just another version of it. The Muslims are the new Jews. We are the new ones that the, these people with this very nasty streak in them, they have found. They always like the alien, the other, to pick on. In the past it was the Jews, today it is the Muslims. Because fundamentally, for 90% of Muslims, okay, the reality is that they just want to live a peaceful life, they want to benefit from what they can materialistically from society, and in fact, in general, they want to contribute to the well-being of humanity. We want to live peaceful lives for us, our families, and our children, right? Islam teaches us about how to be a good neighbor to the extent that the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, he swore by God. He said, Wallahi, by God, he is not a believer. Wallahi, by God, he is not a believer. By God, he is not a believer. The one whose neighbor is not safe from his mischief. And the Prophet did not say as to whether this neighbor was a Muslim or not. It doesn't matter. If your Muslim, if your neighbor is Muslim or not Muslim, it doesn't matter. You cannot be mischievous and destroy, uh, to annoy your neighbor. In fact, it's impossible that you are a person of faith in God and you could treat your neighbor like that. In fact, indeed, the Prophet ﷺ said, he is not a believer who sleeps with his stomach full or her, her stomach full while her neighbor is hungry. You, you can't be believing in God and your stomach is full and your neighbor is hungry. In fact, the Prophet said, when you cook, add some more, make some more stew, make the cooking more, so you can share it with your neighbors. This is what its specific instructions in Islam, even to the extent that you should share your food with your neighbors. The Prophet ﷺ, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, himself, in Mecca, he used to live next to, and this is a very famous story, many Muslims today have heard of this story, of course. He used to, one of his neighbors was a Jewess. And she regularly used to throw rubbish on the Prophet, or on the path of the Prophet, when the Prophet Sallallahu used to walk down the street. Regularly she used to do this. And one day, the Prophet was walking past the street, and what did he notice? No rubbish that day thrown on him. Right? So what did he do? He went back and he knocked on the door. And the maidservant of the house answered the door, and he started saying, he started asking, you know, um, is, your, is your mistress okay? Is she well? Is there anything I can do for her? You know, I'm her neighbor, I live just close by. If there's anything I can do to help her, please just let me know. Okay, along, something along these lines, okay. Uh, when this woman, she heard about this, she said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I testify there is no God but God. And Muhammad is the messenger of God. Only prophets have character like this. So this is how the Prophet Muhammad treated his neighbor. There was a great scholar of Islam. His name was Sufyan Athawri. And next to him used to live a Jew. His neighbor was a Jew. So many people used to come and beg this Jew, let me buy your house. Let me. They used to offer him huge amounts of money to buy his house. Because they wanted to live as Muslims next to this great scholar. And he kept on refusing. And he said to them, where am I going to be able to find a house and have a neighbor like Sufyan? <laughs> where am I going to find a house and I'm going to have a neighbor like Sufyan? This is how, this is our religion. Okay? So this is our deen, is that our deen is seeking to create a better society. We all agree, therefore, any sensible person and the only person I really who think will not agree with this, 
are the extremists on both ends of the spectrum, right? They will be the extremists on both ends of the spectrum. The neo-fascists, right? And the Muslim extremists. But in between that are the ordinary people. So in reality, what are we saying? We are saying, look, we agree upon the same things. The only thing we disagree upon is how do we reach that goal? Here's the goal we want to reach. And we all want to reach the same goal. But we are disagreeing, really, about the means that we reach that goal. Okay? How much freedom should the individual have? And in what way should we punish those people who transgress those limits? Right? But if you look at it, the argumentation about, oh, you punish people like this and you punish people like that, these are in reality the externalities. You know, these things are not evil in and of themselves. They are really different goals, different means to reach the same goal, the same destination. Now, it may seem to the eyes of people who live in Norway or England or I don't know, wherever at the moment, people may seem, they may say, oh, these laws that you Muslims have, they are very barbaric. Yeah? And I will admit, from the point of view of someone who's brought up in the West, they seem very barbaric. Right? Chopping the hand of the thief, for example. It seems very barbaric. Okay? There's no doubt about that. If you're brought up here, that's how it's going to look. Okay? But what is the objective? The objective is that people will live in a safer society. Similarly, what, we all agree that stealing is bad, don't we? Right? I don't think anyone's going to disagree that stealing is bad. No one who's had their property stolen and has had things taken from them is going to think that's good. Right? So we're talking about how, what is the solution to the problem? How do we reach the goal that we want to achieve? We have now we have different opinions about that. Okay? Now you may say the punishment is harsh, but then we can point to examples historically and even in the world today where that punishment is implemented. First of all, very few people receive that punishment. But in spite of that, the society is really, really safe. People can leave their goods, people can leave even their gold, their cars, they leave doors open and people are not harmed. Even in England, in UK, I recently, just the other day, had my bike stolen, okay, from the back of my garden, right? And my wife was going around, okay, knocking on the doors of neighbors and so many people said we've had the same problem. Right? And my wife, she's actually sometimes a bit more fiery than even me. And I have to say, calm down a bit, you know, and whatever, right? And she was saying to the neighbor, you know, I think we should probably chop their hands off, it's the good thing. And the neighbor's going, yes, that's a good idea, right? <laughs> I think that's it. And you would be surprised. You would be surprised how many people, right, would agree with that, right? You see, in Islam, it's not about some mad Muslims as hordes going around hide jumping on some person they think is a thief and just slashing their hand off like that. And we got him, here's his hand. You know, like in that film, I, what's that film, that superhero? Uh, what's his, you know, anyway, I, you know, forget it, man. He, anyway, I just saw like three seconds of it and he sharpens this thing and he chops the hand off this terrorist, you know, and comes with the hand and what's it called? I don't care, but anyway, the point being is that you'd be surprised how many people would say, yeah, you know, because what? Really, seriously, okay, we're in, in Islam, we're not talking about gratuitously just, you know, amputating people's hands. No, it's not like that. It is a legal process, like any other legal process. No one gets punished or should get punished according to Islamic law, until they have gone through the proper legal process, just like any other legal process. They have to go to the court, they have to go to the judge, right? And you see, the baby's agreeing, okay? <laughs> yeah, okay. <clears throat> and, you know, and just like any other legal process, and there are conditions, there are conditions. For example, if the person who stole, right, is stealing out of some great need or necessity like hunger, extreme hunger, or you know, there is some severe family problem and you know, whatever. I mean, this is, no, the punishment is for people who are gratuitously stealing. That's just, they, you know, they just steal because that's what they do, not because they have some need. So there are all, you know, there are conditions that have to be laid down, just like every other punishment. But we have to say, we have to ask, yes, it may seem to us, right, that it is, you know, severe, and so and so on with many of the Sharia punishments.
But in reality, we also have to be honest and we have to look at society. You know, and I don't know much about Norwegian society, but obviously I live in, you know, I live in London. And the part of London where I live, okay, every single week we are hearing about kids who are shooting each other, who are stabbing each other, who are killing each other. We hear about perfectly innocent people being beaten to death by gangs of youth, literally in front of their daughters, in front of their children. Right? It's actually becoming so common that now they don't even half the time bother even mentioning it in the newspapers. Right? I mean, you know, this is the question. You say, you say that these punishments are violent, these punishments are harsh, right? But what is happening to a society? What is happening to our societies? How about those people who are being beaten and stabbed and killed? Right? How about those people who are having that? Don't they have rights? Don't they have the right? Isn't the purpose of law to protect the society? Isn't the purpose? So when you send people to prison, right? Now you may argue, and you see, we all want to achieve the same thing. We all want a peaceful society. But you will say, no, we are humane. Okay? We don't do these barbaric things. Okay, well, okay, fine, that's, in my opinion, just polemics, right? But what do you do? You send people to prison. And I'm not, I don't know about Norway, but let's talk about England, for example, right? If it's the same, you'll know what I'm talking about. What happens in prison? Most of the time. Most of the time when people go to prison, right, they sit down with other thieves, other criminals, and probably they'll sit down with people who committed worse crimes than they even did, right? And what do they do? They sit there feeling, oh, I'm so bad, I shouldn't have done that, I'm going to be a good boy next time, right? You know, you know what they do? They sit down with the other thieves and criminals, and those other thieves and criminals teach them how to commit crimes, right? If he didn't know how to pick a lock, by the time he's out of prison, he'll know how to pick a lock. If he didn't know how to break out a, a window, he'll know, because you know what, he's gone to a university of crime. <laughs> no, it's serious. He's gone to a university, or she's gone to a university of crime. And so when that person comes out, are they thinking, oh, I'm not going to do this? No, they say, I'll do it better, I'll do it better next time, and I won't get caught, because I've learned some new tricks that I didn't learn before. Now you tell me, does this stop the thief from stealing? No, 80% people reoffend. Does it protect society? It doesn't protect society. In fact, you've just made society worse, right? So, let, let's just forget the polemics, right? Let's forget the polemics. Let's be honest, right? About what is working as a system, because the whole point of laws is to protect society and to create a peaceful, prosperous society. You know, everyone, I tell you something. You know, 20 years ago, when I became Muslim, I went down to Speaker's Corner in London. I stand, you can see some of the videos probably of me standing up there, ah, shouting away, right? And I wasn't shouting because I was angry. I'm shouting because it's the only way you get heard in Speaker's Corner, right? And I'm standing there. And one of the things I used to talk about, right, is the evil of interest, right? The evil of interest and the system and the economic system that is based upon interest. And I used to talk about how the whole interest-based system is controlling, it's a new means to control and colonize the third world. And it's very cruel and it's very evil, right? Because they generate this enthusiasm through the propaganda, through the media propaganda, which we talked about yesterday, right? Who do the media support? Obviously, they write what their advertisers want them to write, okay? Okay, I'm sorry to say, Many journalists are nothing more than intellectual prostitutes, really. They have, they have intelligence, but they prostitute it to whoever is going to pay them. And you'll see, they will change their mind. One day they will be writing this, next five years they'll be writing that. Whoever pays them, they'll write for them. Right? And who is their paymaster? The, the newspapers and the magazines that depend and rely upon what? Advertising. We went through that yesterday. Okay? So, these banks... They create this, not the banks, but the society through this propaganda, through the media. They go to the third world. They create in the minds and hearts of these people a perceived need for products they actually don't need. But they create that desire. So what do they say to them? 
How do you get these products? How do you get them? Well, you know, if you want to buy our goods, yeah, if you want to buy our sophisticated Western goods, of course we're not going to we're not going to accept, uh, you know, I don't know whatever the currency is, you know, uh, Kenyan shillings or you know, you know, shells or I don't know what people. No, we need real money, dollars, pounds, right? But if you want, you know, dollars and pounds, I will tell you what you need to do. What you need to do is you need to grow cash crops, things like coffee, cocoa, tea, yeah? And what you do is then you sell them to us. Now those things are valuable to us and we'll give you dollars for that, right? So what do people do? Is they, the land that the people used to use to feed themselves for agriculture, yeah? They then convert to cash crops. Huge swaths of land being converted to cash crops. But of course what they don't tell all of these poor people is they're telling every other poor person to do the same thing. So what happens according to the economic system when you have a glut, right, of any particular product, right? You have an over, you know, if you have too much coffee, too much cocoa, too much sugar, too much tea, what happens? Supply and demand, right? The cost goes down. The price is less, right? So you have all of these people producing these cash crops, but there's so much of it in the market. So these people who thought they were going to get nice money for it, what do they find? Lo and behold, they're not getting so much money for it. Okay? The money they're getting is less. But they've turned their arable land into cash crops. And now what starts to happen? That people start to get hungry. The food that they, the, the land they used to grow food on, they're not growing food on that anymore, they're growing cash crops. They don't have any food. And who comes along? The great compassionate Western nations. They come along and they say, don't worry, we've got heaps of grain, we've got heaps of food, we've got stuff, you know, you just need to buy it from us, we'll sell it to you. Right? Well, we haven't got any money. Don't worry, we'll lend you some money. Yeah? We'll lend you some money. Right? But what you need to do is you need to make sure that your whole economic system is designed in a way that you can earn dollars and pounds and so on and so forth. So what happens? They get in a vicious circle. They borrow money to feed the people, right? They need to turn more land to produce more cash crops, but the price of that never meets their expectation. Then they need to borrow more money and then they have the interest on top of that because it's based upon the riba until the state that we have in the third world now that the interest on the debt is actually more than the debt itself. That is total slavery. That is so much more effective than sending armies, right? I mean, why would I want to send my soldiers over there to get killed? Let's just enslave them with debt, right? And you know what? This is not only happening on an internet, this is happening to you. You, your average Norwegian, your average Brit they don't feel the pit well, you know, back in the days when I was trying to say, you know, it's the same for you when you borrow money from the bank. You're becoming a slave. It's like feudalism all over again. You become owned by the bank. The bank becomes like your fool. And when I was saying that, the people are saying, what are you talking about? Right? What are you going on about? Look at the capitalist interest-based system. It's made the world more prosperous. It's made the wor world more successful. Look at it. It's, it's dominant. And you know, it's like I was talking into the wind. But you know what? If you say to people today, okay, suddenly now, when people have been hit by the credit crunch, when they've seen that the banks, is, they are built on air, when they've seen the reality of what Allah said, Yamhaqallahu riba, that Allah will efface riba, Allah, God will, you know, He will make it nothing. And today the world, what, where did seven, no, okay, what is it, 750 billion Bush gave to the banks, right? And then now Obama, another 850 billion, right? Where did all that money go? Where, where did it go? Right? And everyone is suffering. Now you know what? Now when you start talking about the Islamic finance system, that Islam 1,400 years ago had a system of economics that is not based upon interest, that is interest free, that is based upon business and profit and loss sharing. Now suddenly, suddenly people now are listening. Suddenly they say, yeah, you people have got something to say. Right? Although, you know what? 20 years ago, we were just talking, talking, and no one was listening. So the point here is that 
really, what do we want? We want the same thing. Okay? We want the same thing. We just have different... You see, but as Muslims, we don't believe that we as Muslims have, you know, we're so clever and, you know, we're so advanced and we sat down and we thought these things up for ourselves. Okay? No. The fundamental difference here, the real difference is, we as Muslims believe that what we have is from God. <coughs> We believe we have knowledge that is from the creator of the heavens and the earth. The one who created us and knows us. He knows our desires. He knows our needs. He knows human society. He knows how we will react to certain things. He knows how we will respond to certain things. God knows what punishments work and what don't. God knows what environment human beings need to live in to have the most prosperous and peaceful and successful society and where they can live in the best manner because God created us right so this is what it is based upon right our our belief is based upon that and that's really what Islam then means submission to God we all submit in our life we all do things what is submission anyway let's examine submission right <coughs> when you submit what does it mean you give up something that you want or you desire right and you give it up in order to do something that someone else wants and someone else desires right now I'm sure that okay I guess that everyone in this room has parents or a parent right or a carer who looks after them yeah or who has had that in their life yeah okay most of us have right even if we were unfortunate enough to go to an institution still applies now, I'm sure everyone would agree. Doesn't it often happen that your mum and dad tell you to do something that you don't want to do? Oh yeah, of course there is, right? Okay? So, when your parents tell you, do this and do that, or don't do this and don't do that, although you really want to do that thing, right? Or you really don't want to do that thing, but you go ahead and do it. Or you go ahead and abstain from it. That's submission. You're giving up what you want, right, in order to do something to, that someone else wants you to do. So you're submitting. You are submitting yourself to the will of your parents, right? Now, there are three different ways that people submit. Either we submit, right, out of love. We submit out of love. We submit because we love those people, we love that person, and we want to please them, and we want to do, you know, we want to do something, and we all do that, right? If you're married, that's what it's all about, right? You don't want to do the washing up, you don't want to do the cooking, talking about the men here, actually. Huh? And, uh, <laughs> but you know what? Your wife needs help, right? You may not want to do it, but you do it. She asks you to do this, to fix that, to fix this, but you go ahead and do it. Why? Because you love your wife. Right? You love her. You love your kids. Right? You love your parents. So sometimes you do things out of love. But sometimes you do it out of fear. Sometimes you submit out of fear. Why don't often, why don't we break the law? Why don't I just park my car, and why don't I park it in the middle of the street? Right? I used to do that in Egypt. <laughs> yeah. Literally. Right? You park your car in the middle of the street, you go to the policeman, and you said, here's Wahid Ghani. Here's one pound. Guard my car. He will stand next to your car for three hours, right? And he will guard it personally for one pound. And by the way, in those days, you know, one pound was a lot for a policeman since his monthly wage was like, I don't know, five pounds, right? For us, nothing, right? So, you know, can you just park your car? Okay, Norway, right? What happens if you park your car in the middle of the street? Huh? And I've seen a lot of cars parked weirdly in Norway. But what happens generally? Huh? You get fined, right? Is that it? They take your car away? Do they have a toy it away and stuff like that? I don't know, maybe people are really chill out in Norway, right? But in England, my God, you know, any little infringement, your car is parked on a yellow line, this or out of the zone, that's it. Kick it, tow it away, clamp, right? Sometimes the fine you have to pay is more than the price of your car, right? Okay? So what makes you not do that? It's fear. It's fear. You're motivated by fear. I'm afraid of the result. I'm afraid of the punishment. I'm afraid what's going to happen to me if I break this law. So therefore, what do you do? You submit. 
you follow the law because you're afraid of what's going to happen to you if you don't. Right? And sometimes you submit out of just knowing that that's the right thing to do. You go to the doctor. The doctor says, listen, I'm sorry, but you got cancer. I have to operate on you. If you don't, you'll die in two weeks. Now, who, who actually wants to be cut open? Right? Does anyone actually want, oh, let me see, what shall I do for fun today? Let me get myself cut open. All right? Okay? Unless you're some gangster who wants some scars to show off, right? Okay? But apart from that, you don't want that, right? But you know what? You know the doctor's saying the right thing. You know this is the right, so you submit because you know that that's the right thing to do. It makes sense. Right? Now, if there's any other reason why people can submit, I, I don't know. But those are the three reasons. So we're all submitting throughout all of our life to someone or something, right? You never, in fact, I would challenge you to find a single moment when you are not submitting to someone or something. I mean, you can't because as a human being, you have to submit to your biological desires. You have to breathe. Your heart has to bump, pump, you know, blood around your body. You know, you're always submitting to someone or something. You just never escape it throughout your life. So submission is the reality. Of course, there's some things we submit to by choice because we choose to submit or not to submit. Right? So we're all submitting. But what is Islam saying? Islam is saying the one that we should submit to really, in reality, is our Creator, is God. Because whoever you love, God has more right to your love. Think about why you love people. Think about why you love your parents. Think about that. Well, God created your parents. God created your wife. God created your husband. Whatever it is that you love, God created that. So surely you have more reason to love the one who created those things than those things themselves. So God has the most right to your love. So therefore, surely doesn't God have the most right to your submission? Don't you ha doesn't he have the most right that you should give in? Right? To, to do what is pleasing to him? To please him? Yeah. See? Agreement. The one that counts the baby. Okay? And how about fear? Yes, fear. I'm not going to shy away from it. I'm terrified of God. Whatever most terrifying you thing you can think of. The most terrifying pain. And, you know, I don't know you, who's been in pain. Any woman who's given birth to a child knows what pain is. Right? And they say gout is more painful than childbirth, right? You know, it's like a, you know, gout is like a rheumatism, severe form. So we've all experienced pain. How about emotional pain as well? Loss. You know what, and that, that pain's a reality in the world, right? So that pain, whatever that pain is, similarly, that's something God has control over. And God can subject you to even more pain if He wants to, right? If He wants to remove it, He can remove it. So yeah, I, I'm afraid. You should be afraid. God has more right that you should be afraid of Him than anything else. Right? And how about, how about intelligence? How about wisdom? How about following something because it's wise? Well, God is the most wise. He knows everything. If I'm going to decide to submit to something because it's sensible and it makes sense, then God has more right that we should submit on that basis. God's knowledge is perfect and ours is imperfect. So this is the logic behind the essence of Islam. It's the, I don't think that any person would argue with the logic of it. Right? The Quran actually says, if this book is from God, if this book is from God, who else but a fool can reject it? So, I mean, from the premise, at least take the premise, that if the Quran really is from God, surely would any sensible person would agree, right? that the only choice we have is to do what the Qur'an says, right? If it is from God, and we can argue about whether it's from God. And see, this is the point. People argue, oh, your, your, your religion says this, your religion says that, it's got this punishment, it's got this thing, it says you should treat this person in that way, right? But you're missing the point. Because for the Muslim, it's all irrelevant in a sense about the, these details, right? Because if we believe it's from God, if we believe it's from the Creator, right? Then that's what I have to do. I have to submit myself to what the Creator teaches, to what the Creator says. That's what it's about. 
And it may or may not make sense to me. But surely I can recognize that God understands me better than I understand myself. And I'm sure how many people in this room, it's happened to them in their lives. Right? There's things your parents have told you. I mean, anyone who's got kids know that. Don't do that. But how many kids, even 10-year-old kids, think they know better? Right? Let alone if you've got a teenage son. Right? Or daughter. Right? You know, you're trying to tell them, you know, don't do this. It's just not the right thing to do. No, they know better. You don't know what you're talking about. You, you don't know. Right? You, you haven't lived the life that I have lived. Right? You know, you don't know. What, it's in the street like that, out there. Right? Yeah. Because as we in, we're, we're facing all our things, man. Right? It's like, okay. You know, and then what is it? You know, Dad, you were right. <laughs> Can you get me a lawyer to get me out of prison now, please? You know? Yeah, you were right. So, I mean, it's all happened to us, right? I think we've all done that. True or not? Right? So if that's true, just between human beings, how about God? Isn't it possible that you might think you know better, right? But in reality, you don't know better. God knows better, right? So our question as Muslims is this irrelevant. You can go on and on about Islam this and Islam that, and your punishment this, and your Quran this and this. Our question really is, is the Quran from Allah or not? We believe it is. And we think we can prove to you that it is. I mean, when I say prove, we can give you evidence that I don't think any sensible person would reject that evidence, right? So this is the question, right? Is, so this is what our religion is based upon. We surrender ourselves to the Creator. We surrender ourselves to God because we believe that that knowledge, that that thing that God has given us is from the Creator of the heavens and the earth, you know? And God knows best. God knows best what degree of fear is it that you need what threat of punishment is the right threat of punishment in order for a person to stop stealing? What threat of punishment do you need in order to stop people committing adultery and fornication? And how bad is that? And what is the impact of that on society? You may think it's nothing, right? You may think that it's nothing. Because some things, and that's another thing you can all experience, sometimes you don't only find out until a long time, even until it's too late. And then you say, Oh, if only I had known that in the beginning, right? You only find out, uh, it's not that everything, right, straight away that you realize, oh, that was the wrong thing to do. No, sometimes you only discover that it was the wrong thing to do after a long time. And this is the thing that God knows the long-term effects. God knows what is going to happen over the long time. Sometimes even we human beings don't live long enough. We don't live long enough to be able to see the effect of something could happen two generations ahead or three. And our human experience doesn't allow us even to collate that. But God knows that. God knows the effect, right? Years down the line, right? Of allowing this particular thing that is considered a sin. You let people fornicate, you let people, you know, participate in, in certain acts and so on. But you may think, what's the harm? It's, you know, this and that. But you only sometimes know the harm down the line, when it's too late. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. If you listen to some of my talks about women in Islam, and I gave a talk about this in England just recently, they might put it up on YouTube so you might catch it. Right? And for those who like, like a bit more tough speaking from me, you'll find it there, right? You know, look at this, this so-called enduring revolution of the Western world, the liberation of women. Okay, no doubt, right, that women in the West previously have been extremely oppressed, right? They weren't allowed property or when they got married, right? Until today, by the way, most women, they get married, I think, in, in Norway, they still, they take their husband's name, yeah? They become, you know, Mrs. Svensson, right, or whatever, right? Okay, and you know, she wasn't that before, but now she's... That goes back to, right, not long ago when women literally were owned by their husband. When she got married, her property automatically became her husband's property. We forget, right? We forget that. Before, it's not long ago that women had no say in the society, right? They couldn't vote. They couldn't inherit, 
So they were very restricted. So there's no doubt in contrast to that, what women experience today in the West is really good. But, you know, I'm talking about, let's look, talk about the, uh, going back to the issue of long-term long effects, right? You see, this is the short-term thinking. In the short term, West, the Western world in general thought that women's liberation is a good thing in the perspective of getting women to work. Why? Because according to their philosophy, a rich society is a successful society because what? Wealth equals happiness. So the more wealth we have, the more successful we are. Now what's the point in having half the population staying at home when that half the population could be out working and contributing to the economy and making us richer and therefore making us more successful. So there it starts, no women, you don't want to stay at home, you need to come, you need to work, right? Why do you want to stay at home? You're going to be a slave, chained to the sink, slave to your husband, slave to your children, whatever, you know, you, you beneath that, right? You're beneath that, you need to be liberated, yeah? You need to come, you need to work, right? Yeah, earn your own money, spend your own money, huh? Sounds nice, right? Okay, and the women saying, oh, that's good, you know, right, so what happens, women start going out to work. Okay, what do we have, right? 20, 30 years on, right, some economist starts figuring out, oh gosh, we've got a problem. You know what the problem is? Right? The problem is, is that since women are all working, and they've got now so enthusiastic about being liberated, they're not having babies anymore. And what happens to a society where you stop having babies? If no women have babies, what's going to happen to your population? Huh? You're going to die out. Right? You're going to die out. And lo and behold, the Western world, like a light bulb, oh dear, our populations are dying out. It's true. No, it's true. And you know it's true. Right? I've got some real sincere advice for Norwegians. If you're afraid about Muslims taking over, have more babies. <laughs> yeah? Plain and simple. Right? But you know what? I tell you the simple truth, they won't do it. Because they're too addicted now. Right? They're too addicted. But you know what? This is the short-sightedness. You know, I mean, you'd think it was really sensible. Women stop having babies, population dies, oh dear, problem for our country. But no, money, money, money. Let's improve our economy, right? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's so simple, right? But that's it. That's the sh you only discovered that two generations. And you know what? Economists now, they realized that when six, no, sorry, when 30% of your population reaches the age of 65, which is retirement age, the economy of your, your country is no longer viable because the amount of money you need to spare, spend on pensions and caring for old people exceeds the amount that your economy can generate. And that is exactly what is happening in Europe now. Right? And believe me, I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, yeah? They say, oh, we let you Muslims come here. Right? We let you come here. And you don't even respect our ways. Right? Yeah? Rubbish. Right? They need you so bad. Right? They need you. They need new people in order to repopulate the country and continue the economy. That's what they need. Right? That's what they need. Right? And you know, they would love to have white blonde people like them. Right? But the problem is, Eastern Europe has a worse population problem than them. Right? They, their demographics are even worse. Generally, in the industrial countries in Europe, they don't have enough people to repopulate. Okay, and England is an exception. You know why England is an exception? Because the immigrants are having more babies than everyone else. That's why. Right? So don't be fooled by this, oh, you better be grateful, right? Take off your hijabs, right? Anyway, you'll just fall into the same problem that they've fallen into. You'll get liberated, we'll stop having babies, and then we'll die out, which is maybe what they want, I don't know. Right? But anyway, the point being, apart from, you know, the silliness of it all, right? The, apart from the silliness of it all, the fact is, all I'm trying to illustrate by all of that, right? Okay? 
And it actually goes back to my point, anyway, to finish that. What I'm trying to illustrate is how you can think short term and you'll only realize when it's too late the mistake you made, right? But you know what? If we'd only followed the guidance of God, right? And you know what? You don't even need to be a Muslim. It's there in the Bible as well. As Christianity used to teach that, go forth and multiply. Christians used to be concerned with having lots of kids because that's not what, what, because that's what God said. They didn't know about economics, Right? They didn't know about economic theory. They didn't know about population demographics. They did it because what? God said do it. Right? It's the same. Right? But you leave the guidance of God for the limited, very limited, confused notions of human beings and see what you end up with. Right? And this is by no means, by the way, I, don't want, to, I want to counter something. I am not saying that women shouldn't be educated. Actually, women should be more educated than men. And the reason is, okay, the reason is because the one who teaches the children and who imbibes with them morality and who teaches them and the future generations are the women. Okay? Women have skill sets that men do not have. Vocabulary, with my, me being the exception, okay? They have vocabulary skill sets, okay? They have the ability to communicate. And that's actually why in many places in the workplace women do very well is because they have very good communication skills okay and we live in a society that's very much not industry based anymore it's communication based right but those skills are built there by Allah actually it's interesting in some of these things even if you believe in evolution or you believe in God you actually come with the same result you come with the same result you know evolution will tell you that you are women are you know, biologically programmed for that. And actually we believe that Allah created them. So the, the result is the same, right? And so this is the thing. We believe, no, that, that Islam has the wisdom. Islam is not saying women can't work. And Islam certainly does not say that women should not be educated. And, you know, anyone, I don't know how big, I don't care how big his beard is, right? Goes around saying that women should not be educated and we should blow up their schools. He is mad. He is insane, right? However, I don't really necessarily believe, in fact, I don't really believe what I read in the newspapers at all, right? But that's certainly not from Islam. Women should be educated because they need to teach the next generation. That's very, very important, right? Okay? And so Islam is really encouraging that. Okay? And it's, Islam has this division of labor. Okay? That's right. God has made men the maintainers and protectors of women. It's the division of labor. And it's actually the most efficient way. For Homo sapiens succeeded primarily because they divided labor, according to evolutionary theory. And Neanderthals failed because they didn't. Neanderthals failed because basically men and women did the same thing. Homo sapiens succeeded because they divided labor between men and women. Right? Check it out. Interesting. Which makes, you know, European heading towards Neanderthal times, right? Okay? So, according to their theories, okay? So, brothers and sisters, the point being, all I'm trying to illustrate is the benefit and the wisdom of following the guidance of God in our affairs, okay? So, this ultimately leads us to conclude, right? That the real question we have to ask, the reasonable question that needs to be asked, okay, is what is the best way for us to reach the goals that we all have? We have the same goals, Right? Now Muslims are quite happy to live in Western society and we will be good citizens and we will obey the laws of the country and by and large, I mean that is exactly what our religion teaches us to do. Right? It may not be God's law, but God tells us that we have to respect those laws in the country in which we live. And we have to respect the, you know, the government and we don't believe 